Less than an hour's drive west from Dublin lies the small town of Kilbegan, a town that has been home to many distilleries over the years, and it's obvious why. There's plenty of fresh water to turn into whiskey, bogs to provide the fuel to power the stills, and Westmead itself is a great barley producing county. The most famous of these distilleries, acknowledged as the oldest licensed distillery in the world dating back to 1757, was John Locke and Sons Distillery, and it was this distillery that brought an Irish government to its knees. Welcome to episode 21 of Stories and Sips. My name is Barry Chandler, an Irishman in Ohio, helping introduce Americans to the tales and tastes of Irish whiskey. I have a bottle of Kilbegan single grain Irish whiskey beside me, which I'm sipping on. Uh, a lovely whiskey. Single grain doesn't mean there's just one grain in it. It actually means it's from one single uh, distillery. There's actually two different grains in there. There's a mixture of corn. Actually, the majority of it is corn, 90 plus percent corn, and then malted barley to go with that. So it's a lovely, it's a sweeter Irish whiskey than I'm normally used to. In the early 1800s, John Locke had tried unsuccessfully to launch whiskey ventures before he eventually came to Kilbegan. Due to decline in Irish whiskey sales in the 1840s, he was able to pick up the assets of the distillery in Kilbegan at a steep discount. And over the next 50 years, the distillery grew and grew under John Locke and his family. And it grew as demand for whiskey rebounded and increasingly distilleries had access to the UK and the common. Commonwealth markets provided them with a fantastic uh, audience. And for many years, the Locke family enjoyed a great lifestyle on the proceeds of their whiskey sales. Uh, but as Irish whiskey sales declined post prohibition and the Irish Civil War, the Locke family, who by this stage had become quite fragmented and involved in many different businesses, weren't as focused on running the distillery operations. And instead, they left that to the management. Now, management were used to living a good life too. Uh, uh, especially on the back of the incredible Irish whiskey sales for the years preceding. And when whiskey demand decreased, so did their pay and the chance of the distillery closing increased. So this led to some illicit operations being run out of the distillery, such as blending raw distillate with already matured stock to avoid waiting for it to age and then shipping this lethal cocktail out of the distillery in the dead of night to unsuspecting customers around, uh, around Ireland. Some chancers those managers were. But after the Second World War, the surviving Locke family members, two sisters incidentally, who had little interest in running a whiskey business, decided to put the entire operation up for sale, including its stock of raw ingredients and a lot of maturing whiskey. In steps an international syndicate who put in a bid of £305,000, which was accepted. And the syndicate included a Swiss businessman, an Irish solicitor or lawyer, and an English crook, all of whom had previously been involved in various schemes together in the past. Now what they realised was that for that price, they'd be getting 60,000 gallons of matured whiskey for around £5 a gallon. And they figured that they could then resell this stock immediately on the English black market for around £11 a gallon. Now this quantity of uh, whiskey was more than the distillery's export quota allowed, so they'd need to find a way to increase the quota to complete their little scam. Enter a local auctioneer who was hired to complete the sale. Now he happened to be an Irish political party senator and he reckoned that he could use his influence to have the government increase the quota. Now to make this happen, he thought it would be a great idea to give then Irish Prime Minister or Taoiseach in Irish, Eamon de Valera, a Swiss gold watch as a token of their appreciation in facilitating this. Oh, they were no fools. But management at the distillery got word of what was happening, and they were worried that the distillery would be shut down after such a deal was made, especially if this consortium were able to double their money and then they could just walk away. So to protect themselves, they tipped off an up-and-coming politician who decided to raise the matter in Parliament. Well, it wasn't long before the whole country was talking about bribery and corruption and the thought of Ireland losing precious whiskey stock to the dreaded foreigners. Locke's scandal took centre stage during the election year of 1948 and de Valera resorted to calling Ireland's first 
of many tribunals to clear him and his party. Now, while they were cleared of any wrongdoing at the tribunal, voters weren't so kind at the polls and the then Fianna Fáil party, which was their name, were knocked out of power for the first time in 16 years. The distillery and its whiskey brought down the government. The deposit for the distillery from the consortium was never received as promised by the dubious international uh, consortium and the deal fell through as quickly as the government had fallen. And so it was back to the management of the distillery to try to figure out how to keep things going. A few years later, in 1954, Tullamore Dew, which was located a few miles down the road, closed its gates due to declining global demand for Irish whiskey once again. And so it was that in 1956, Kilbegan's most famous distillery, John Locke & Sons, closed its doors, uh, unable to meet its debt obligations, closed their doors for the first time in 200 years. And the public, uh, I think the brand was still reeling from the public image problem of the bribery scandal a few years before. So demand had dried up for their whiskey and now the whiskey was drying up. The distillery itself was abandoned and eventually fell victim to the elements, Irish rain of course, and to lack of habitation. Now this was a distillery that had at one point or another employed almost everyone in Kilbegan. If you didn't work there, there was a good chance a family member did. This is where it gets romantic. This is the stuff movies are made out of. Proud locals, they kept paying the distillery fee to the government year after year so that there'd always be a distillery in their town. And they were hoping one day it might be operational again. Then lo and behold, in 1983, a group of enterprising locals decided it was time for the distillery to see life again and they formed a restoration committee which was made up of tradesmen and craftsmen from the town who all donated time and materials to bring the site back to life as both an industrial and an archaeological museum all based around this model of an old 18th century distillery and it still had a functioning water wheel um, uh, on the premises. There's actually a great clip from Irish uh, state broadcaster RTE about this period of time when uh, the locals were interviewed back in the 1980s about bringing this distillery back to life and I'll put a link to the, the um, that interview in the show notes. And then in 1987, John Teeling, father of the present day operators of the Teeling Distillery in Dublin, he founded the Cooley Distillery in County Loud in Ireland, a very influential distillery over the last number of years but he converted an old potato alcohol plant into a modern whiskey distillery. And the Cooley distillery then brought a number of mothballed old Irish whiskey brands to life through Cooley, such as Tyrconnell and Locks Whiskey. And then they bought the distillery site at Kilbegan to mature that whiskey in the warehouses right there in Kilbegan. In 2007, 260 years after the doors first opened, the Locks distillery did start making whiskey once again under the name Kilbegan this time instead of Lox. And a small old pot still that originally came from the old Tullamore distillery uh, was discovered in storage. And then a second identical one was made to order and that, that allowed them to create a small little boutique style distillery uh, right there in Kilbegan to fire that up uh, to start distilling once again. And the first whiskey to come out of Kilbegan following their restoration uh, and that was made 100% on site was Kilbegan's small batch rye whiskey which was made to an old, re an old uh, recipe with a mash of malt, barley and then around 30% rye. And this whiskey kind of looks back to the 1800s when many large Irish distillers used a kind of a spicier rye in their mash. And it's the only modern Irish whiskey to use this amount of rye in its mash today. Remarkably, it was management's fears in the 1940s that the distillery would fall into foreign hands that led to the tip-off that brought down the government. What a turn of events then that thanks to foreign ownership today, distilling continues and that there are plenty of jobs for the locals. American drinks company Beam bought Kilbegan and Cooley in 2012 and then Beam themselves were acquired by Suntory, the Japanese conglomerate, in 2014. It's funny to think of the offer of a gold watch to a government minister. It now seems fairly quaint in light of some of the brown envelopes and scandals we're more used to today. And while there might be foreign owners, to those in, in Kilbegan, this is local whiskey. It's made from the river that runs through the town. And I don't imagine they'll be bringing down any governments anytime soon. But as long as they do keep distilling and innovating and giving us uh, some great whiskies to come out of the Kilbegan distillery, uh, we'll all have something great to look forward to. Slaunching. <laughs>